Welcome to lecture number one, The Dangers of Democracy. I find that the title of this lecture alone is sometimes a little bit surprising to people because we are taught that in this nation we have a democracy, we're a democratic form of government. Probably the first place we need to really start with an understanding of the Constitution is with an understanding of what our founding fathers meant when they used certain words. A great quote from Joseph Sobran helps us with this. He says, one of the great goals of education is to initiate the young into the conversation of their ancestors, to enable them to understand the language of that conversation in all its subtlety. We find that many of the writings of the Founding Fathers, particularly the Federalist Papers, are written in a language that's a little foreign to many of the people in our nation today. It's Old English, it's often very verbose in the way they wrote, it's a little difficult for us to understand. Throughout these six lectures, we'll talk about some of the words that our Founding Fathers used and what those words meant to them at that time. In particular, starting with the word democracy versus republic. As we turn in the U.S. Constitution to Article 4, Section 4, it says, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. You may recall that as we pledge our allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, the next line says, and to the republic, not a democracy. We were founded as a republic, and it's interesting to find the difference between the two and what the founders were so intent on preventing. They wanted to make sure that we were not a democracy. And I was quite surprised to learn some of the things our founders said. For example, James Madison saying, a democracy is the most vile form of government. I was raised believing that a democracy was the pinnacle. This was the ideal. This is the best form of government. And yet they had a very different view of this. Probably the best place to go to understand the difference between a democracy and a republic is a video produced by the John Birch Society a few years ago called Overview of America. This was produced by John McManus, the president of the John Birch Society. The United States of America. Born in 1776, our country is the offspring of a religious-based heritage of liberty under law. Blessed with great natural resources and a pioneer people given to industry and moral discipline, our nation grew to be strong and prosperous and developed the finest governmental system ever devised by man. America soon became known as the refuge of the world's tired, hungry, and poor. Millions left everything in the old world to start over in a land that rewarded initiative and hard work and perseverance. The many millions who didn't come here found comfort and hope in knowing that indeed there was such a bastion of freedom and opportunity, a place where dreams could become reality. Today, our nation appears wealthier and more powerful than ever. New technologies have revolutionized our daily lives. Luxuries once enjoyed only by the rich are commonplace and very affordable. Home ownership is widespread and our people have the expectation of continued economic growth and prosperity. Yet more and more people are coming to realize that they may prosper materially only for a time because their freedoms are diminishing. The sobering reality is that America has been led far from its praiseworthy beginnings. Our people and businesses groan under a heavy burden of economic, political, and social problems, which are the result of a widespread departure from the fundamental truths that made our nation great. If the United States of America is to endure, citizens far and wide must once again come to understand, embrace, and live by timeless concepts, concepts called Americanism. What made America great and set it apart from other lands 
Was it natural resources? No, other lands are equally blessed. Was it the people? No, the people who built America came from elsewhere. Was it government planning and wisdom that spurred our nation to such heights? No again. It wasn't what government did that made America great. It was what government was prevented from doing that made the difference. What set America apart from other lands was freedom for the individual. Freedom to work, to produce, to succeed, and especially to keep the fruits of one's labors. America became great precisely because the stifling effect of too much government had been prevented. However, freedom in America was not totally unrestrained. Americans overwhelmingly chose to limit their actions with moral codes such as the Ten Commandments, personal morality and limited government. It's a combination that characterized America and made it the envy of the world. When our founding fathers decided they'd had enough of British oppression, they broke away and declared independence. They stated as self-evident truth in the Declaration of Independence that men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. In other words, God gave man his rights, and that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in the very next sentence, the founders defined the proper role of government when they stated that to secure these rights, governments are instituted. This is the entire philosophical base of our nation. Here the government cannot legitimately redistribute the wealth, assume power over the people's lives, and dominate man's existence with oppressive taxation, regulations, and controls. According to the founders, government was to be a negative force, which leaves people alone. Its sole function is to protect citizens from one another and from foreign governments and especially from their own government itself. The founders did not create a government to be a positive force to do things for people, to take from some, to give to others. They understood that when a government starts doing something for one citizen, it has to take from another to do so. And in the process, it gains control over both. Britain's rulers didn't accept the Declaration of Independence, so our forefathers had to fight a war to make it stick. By 1783, the war for independence had been won, and British forces were sent back across the sea. But the governmental system at that time was weak. It had no power to settle disputes between the states, nor the power to tax for proper needs, such as national defense. So in 1787, delegates from 12 of the 13 states met in Philadelphia to revise the system, and they produced an entirely new governmental structure known as the Constitution of the United States. Keeping faith with the thunderous assertions in the Declaration, the Constitution was written to govern the government, not the people, and not the states, each of which was a jealous guardian of its own sovereignty. The founders created a central government with strictly limited powers. This left the states free to compete with one another, to be the best state, the one with the least amount of taxation and controls, one where citizens would want to build a business and raise a family. That spirit of competition produced excellence, as honest competition always does. It's important to note that the Constitution wasn't forced on the people. It was sent back to the states for ratification, and several of the Founding Fathers wrote essays explaining it in an effort to persuade fellow Americans to adopt this new system of government. Some of the essays written by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay were collected into a volume known as the Federalist Papers. Those essays provide valuable insights into the intent of the founders in establishing our government. Eventually, all 13 states ratified the Constitution, and then each ratified the first 10 amendments known as the Bill of Rights, further tying the hands of the federal government. These amendments are indeed about rights. But it would have been better had the Bill of Rights been labeled the Bill of Limitations on Government. Why? Because it's vital to realize that the Bill of Rights never gave citizens any rights whatsoever. Its sole purpose was to safeguard God-given rights by limiting government power. The founders even insisted that Congress shall make no law about speech, religion, the press, assembly, the right to petition, the right to keep and bear arms, and so on. 
These amendments are directed squarely at the federal government, not the individual and not the states. They are like most of the Ten Commandments, which are essentially, thou shall not. The Bill of Rights says Congress shall not, shall not, shall not, all the way up to the marvelous Tenth Amendment, which says in effect, if we forgot anything, you can't do that either. When Benjamin Franklin exited the Constitutional Convention, he was asked by a woman, Sir, what have you given us? His immediate response was, A republic, ma'am, if you can keep it. Yet most Americans today have been persuaded that our nation's governmental system is a democracy and not a republic. The difference between these two is essential in understanding Americanism and the American system. Before we discuss political systems, however, it's helpful to address the confusion that has been spread about the political spectrum. Many have been led to believe that the political spectrum places groups such as communists on the far left, fascists or dictators on the far right, and political moderates or centrists in the middle. However, a more accurate political spectrum will show government having zero power on the far right to having 100% power on the far left. At the extreme right, there is no government. The extreme left features total government under such labels as communism, socialism, Nazism, fascism, princes, potentates, dictators, kings, any form of total government. Those who claim that Nazis and fascists are right-wing never define their terms. This amounts to spreading confusion. Toward the middle of the political spectrum can be found the type of government limited to its proper role of protecting the rights of the people. That's where the Constitution of the United States is. Those who advocate such a form of government are really constitutional moderates. So let's analyze the basic forms of government. They are monarchy or dictatorship ruled by one, oligarchy ruled by a few, democracy ruled by a majority, republic ruled by law, and anarchy which is ruled by no one. In discussing these five, we'll see that they can be narrowed down to even fewer. Looking first at monarchy or dictatorship, this form of government doesn't really exist in the practical sense. It's always a group that puts one of its members up front. A king has his council of nobles or earls, and every dictator has his bureaucrats or commissars, the men behind the scenes. This isn't ruled by one, even though one person may be the visible leader. It's ruled by a group. So let's eliminate monarchy, dictatorship, because it never truly exists. Oligarchy, which is ruled by a group, is the most common form of government in all history. And it is the most common form of government today. Most of the nations of the world are ruled by a powerful few, and therefore oligarchy remains. At the other end, we find anarchy, which means without government. Some people have looked over history and found that many of its worst crimes were committed by governments. So they decided that having no government might be a good idea. But this is a mistake, because as the ancient Greeks stated, without law there can be no freedom. Our founding fathers agreed and held that some amount of government is a necessary force in any civilized orderly society. In a state of anarchy, however, everyone has to guard life, liberty and property and the lives of family members. Everyone must be armed and movement is severely restricted because one's property has to be protected at all times. Civilized people have always hired someone to do the guarding, a sheriff, a police force, or some branch of government. Once law enforcement was in place, the people were freer. They could leave their property, work in the fields, and so on. In short, the proper amount of government makes everyone freer. There are some who advocate anarchy, however, not because they want no government, but because they don't like what they have. They use anarchy as a tool for revolutionary change. The condition of anarchy is very much like a vacuum where something rushes in to fill it. These calculating anarchists work to break down the existing government with rioting, killing, looting, and terrorism. Tragically, the people living in such chaos often go to those best able to put an end to it and beg them to take over and restore order. And who is best able to put an end to the chaos? The very people who started it. The anarchists who created the problem then create a government run by them, an oligarchy, where they have total power. This is exactly what happened in Russia that led to Lenin taking total power, 
and in Germany where Hitler's brown shirts created the chaos that brought him to power. But anarchy isn't a stable form of government. It's a quick transition from something that exists to something desired by the power hungry. It's a temporary condition. And because it isn't permanent, we eliminate it as well. The word democracy comes from two Greek words, demos meaning people and kratian meaning to rule. Democracy therefore means the rule of the people, majority rule. This of course sounds good, but suppose the majority decides to take away one's home or business or children. Obviously there has to be a limit. The flaw in democracy is that the majority isn't restrained. If more than half the people can be persuaded to want something in a democracy, they rule. What about republic? Well, that comes from the Latin, res meaning thing and publica meaning public. It means the public thing, the law. A true republic is one where the government is limited by law, leaving the people alone. America's founders had a clean slate to write on. They could have set up an oligarchy. In fact, there were some who wanted George Washington to be their king. But the Founding Fathers knew history, and they chose to give us the rule of law in a republic, not the rule of a majority in a democracy. Why? Let's demonstrate the difference in the setting of the Old West. Consider a lynch mob in a democracy. 35 horseback riders chase one lone gunman. They catch him, and they vote 35 to 1 to hang him. Democracy has triumphed and there's one less gunman to contend with. Now consider the same scenario in a republic. The 35 horseback riders catch the gunman and vote 35 to 1 to hang him. But the sheriff arrives and he says, you can't kill him, he's got his right to a fair trial. So they take the gunman back to town. A jury of his peers is selected and they hear the evidence and the defense and they decide if he shall hang. Does the jury even decide by majority rule no, it has to be unanimous or he goes free. The rights of the government aren't subject to majority rule, but to the law. This is the essence of a republic. Many Americans would be surprised to learn that the word democracy does not appear in the Declaration of Independence or the U.S. Constitution. Nor does it appear in any of the constitutions of the 50 states. The founders did everything they could to keep us from having a democracy. James Madison, rightly known as the father of the Constitution, wrote in essay number 10 of the Federalist Papers, Democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. Alexander Hamilton agreed and he stated, we are a Republican government. Real liberty is never found in despotism or in the extremes of democracy. Samuel Adams, a signer of the Declaration of Independence stated, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. The founders had good reason to look upon democracy with contempt because they knew that the democracies in the early Greek city-states produced some of the wildest excesses of government imaginable. In every case, they ended up with mob rule, then anarchy, and finally tyranny under an oligarchy. During that period in Greece, there was a man named Solon, who urged creation of a fixed body of law not subject to majority whims. But where the Greeks never adopted Solon's wise counsel, the Romans did. Based on what they knew of Solon's laws, they created the 12 tables of the Roman law and in effect built a republic that limited government power and left the people alone. Since government was limited, the people were free to produce with the understanding that they could keep the fruits of their labor. In time, Rome became wealthy and the envy of the world. In the midst of plenty, however, the Roman people forgot what freedom entailed. They forgot that the essence of freedom is the proper limitation of government. When government power grows, people freedom recedes. Once the Romans dropped their guard, power-seeking politicians began to exceed the powers granted them in the Roman Constitution. Some learned that they could elect politicians who would use government power to take property from some and give it to others. Agriculture subsidies were introduced, followed by housing and welfare programs, 
Inevitably, taxes rose and controls over the private sector were imposed. Soon, a number of Rome's producers could no longer make ends meet, and they went on the dole. Productivity declined, shortages developed, and mobs began roaming the streets, demanding bread and circuses from the government. Many were induced to trade freedom for security. Eventually, the whole system came crashing down. They went from a republic to a democracy and ended up with an oligarchy under a progression of the Caesars. Thus, democracy itself is not a stable form of government. Instead, it is the gradual transition from limited government to the unlimited rule of an oligarchy. Knowing this, we as Americans are ultimately left with only two choices. We can keep our republic, as Franklin put it, or we will inevitably end up with an oligarchy, a tyranny of the elite. Just as there is widespread confusion regarding political systems, there is similar confusion in the economic arena. All during the 20th century, Americans were led to believe that there was a great struggle going on between capitalism and the communist world. Undoubtedly, a struggle existed, but the real adversaries were rarely identified properly. No discussion about economic systems will make sense without first defining terms. And one of the most basic terms in economics is capital, whose definition is the means of production. To illustrate what capital is, let's consider a very simple economy. On the sands of a small island, a castaway has just washed ashore. He has no food and he's hungry. He searches the island, he finds no berries, coconuts, or anything edible. He goes back into the water and tries to catch fish with his bare hands, but he fails. So he goes back up on shore and he finds a bush. He breaks off a branch, he gnaws at one end to make a sharp tip. Back into the water he goes, and with his spear, he catches fish. His spear is capital. It's the means of production for catching fish. He gave up some of his time and some of his energy to produce something he could not eat, but something that would help him to produce something that he could eat. Capital, therefore, can be tools, machinery, and even a man's handmade spear to catch fish. Such being the case, consider that the communists in the former Soviet Union, as well as in China and Cuba, have always used tools and machinery. Officials there even view people as capital. Therefore, by strict definition, are not communists capitalists? For that matter, isn't everyone a capitalist? And so, is not every economic system a capitalist system? What then is the difference between what the communist system is and what the American capitalist system is supposed to be? The difference is ownership of the capital. Is the system monopolistic, state-controlled capitalism? Or is it competitive, free enterprise capitalism? It is between these two opposing economic systems that a battle has always raged. Before we proceed, let's also define free market. Basically, it's a self-regulating system in which all parties are completely free to transact with one another. But where force, fraud, or injury damages one party, the government's role is only to punish those who commit such offenses and to vindicate the rights of the other party. This protects the integrity of the free market, or free enterprise system, without intervening in it. The term private property also needs clarification, for private ownership and control of property is a key component in the free enterprise system. In order for ownership of property to be full and complete, all four of its aspects must be met. These are title, control, use, and the ability to dispose of what a person owns. In a free market economy, these aspects are unrestrained so long as the owner does not infringe on the legitimate rights and claims of others. True ownership of property and freedom go hand in hand. They always have. Now let's compare the two systems of capitalism. In the competitive free enterprise system, capital or property is both owned privately and controlled privately. In the monopolistic system, 
Holding title to capital can be accomplished privately or by the state. But more importantly, capital is controlled by the state or by the elite few who control the state. The Communist Manifesto, which contains the basic program for all communists and all socialists, explicitly preaches the destruction and abolition of private property. Karl Marx understood the powers of controlling capital and so have all communists and socialists who have ever looked and still look to Marx as their leader. State-controlled capitalism results in high prices and low quality. After all, why would a monopoly strive to improve if it has no competition? On the other hand, honest, thrifty, and hardworking producers throughout the world prefer competitive free enterprise system for all. Here, low prices and high quality prevail because a variety of producers will seek to attract the widest amount of customers. Competition results in excellence and always has. Just as the political spectrum shows the range of government power, we can also plot the various economic systems along another spectrum. These forms of government control in the market stand in sharp contrast with a completely free market. In the last century or so, there have been basically four forms of state-controlled economies, all on the far left of the economic spectrum. Fascism, Nazism, Socialism, and Communism. In each, the government controls the capital. The difference among these is how much is owned or controlled outright by the government. In a fascist system, the government doesn't own businesses on paper, but it does control them. In Mussolini's Italy, even though he didn't hold title to businesses, he told the owners what to produce, how much to produce, when to produce, where to buy raw materials, who to hire, who to fire, and what price to charge. The rest, he said, was up to them. The fascist system is more efficient than other state control systems insofar as those living under it think they still own their businesses. Shopkeepers concern themselves with maintenance on the machinery, employee relations, painting the building, and so forth. But the government controls owners through an array of taxation and regulations. Under Nazism, which means National Socialism, its proponents went one step further and acquired ownership of some corporations, such as Volkswagen. However, Hitler didn't seize ownership of other industrial giants. He simply controlled them just as Mussolini had controlled businesses in Italy. Socialism is where government officials acquire possession of major industries such as transportation, communications, and utilities in order to leverage control over the entire economy. Through ownership of these vital segments of industry and by creating government regulatory agencies, socialists gain control over virtually everything else. Finally, there is communism, the granddaddy of all in the economic sense, in a way, communism is more honest than fascism because all of the capital is owned and controlled by the state. There are no pretenses about it. Now let's combine political and economic systems because ultimately one never exists without the other. We see again that there are only two ultimate choices. A competitive free enterprise system in a republic or a monopolistic state control system under an oligarchy. A moral people have always been a vital element of America's strength. The Founding Fathers well understood the biblical teaching that righteousness exalteth a nation. They also knew that expecting a free market economy and limited government under a republic to endure without morality was expecting the impossible. James Madison cautioned that limited government alone was inadequate for our nation. And John Adams observed, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. George Washington stated, Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Yet there are people today who think that liberty is license and that morality is unimportant or irrelevant to politics and economics. 
But as Benjamin Franklin added, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. The alternative to Americanism is what has condemned most of the human race to live as slaves throughout the millennia. It is the idea that rights are privileges dispensed by an oligarchy according to the unlimited rule of men, that the state should control or own the nation's capital with all economic activity directed from a central power, and that morality is inconsequential, and that security is preferred over freedom and opportunity. Our nation continues to be steered off course, and the principles that led to America's greatness are being cast aside. The simple question for us is, do we continue to slide away from our nation's founding principles, or do we return to the kind of government we inherited? Time is running out for Americans who sense that something is wrong. They have to decide what kind of a country we shall leave for future generations. All that is needed is for a sufficient number of Americans to get involved in the fight for freedom and to return our nation to less government, more responsibility, and with God's help, a better world. Well, thank you to John McManus for that great explanation of the difference between a democracy and a republic where clearly a republic is a permanent form of government, whereas a democracy must inevitably fall into, as he put it, an oligarchy of the elite. Sometimes we find that people have a difficult time letting go of the word democracy in describing our form of government. Personally, I never use democracy to describe our government, not even in a combination like democracy or a democratic republic or even a representative democracy or anything of that nature. It always leads to confusion. Now, there are some elements in our form of government that are in common with democracy. As this slide illustrates, the concept of majority rule is in common in both a constitutional republic as well as a democracy. The difference, though, is what restrains them. In a true democracy, as demonstrated in the video, majority rule rules. There's nothing to stop it. Whereas in a constitutional republic, it is that constitution which prevents the government from doing things that the majority may wish, including trampling minority rights. So it's essential that we understand that in our constitutional republic, there are some things our government is not allowed to do and follow the constitution. The next place I want to go is a booklet also produced by John McManus entitled A Republic If You Can Keep It. There are a number of additional quotes that help us understand a broader picture of the dangers of democracy. First, as we go to page five, we have England's Duke of Northumberland. Back in 1931, he warned, the adoption of democracy as a form of government by all European nations is fatal to good government, to liberty, to law and order, to respect for authority and to religion. He goes on, and must eventually produce a state of chaos from which a new world tyranny will arise. He was concerned that Europe adopting democracy would lead to chaos. Now today, how are those democracies working out for Europe? Over the last few years, we've seen Europe on the verge of economic collapse. And our next quote will point to exactly why. This one found on page seven, near the top of the page, we have Alexander Fraser Teitler, a famous Scottish historian from the 18th century, where he warns a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves money from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that a democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy, always followed by a dictatorship. What are the challenges that Europe is facing today? 
their loose fiscal policy is leading to financial collapse, exactly as he was describing. Their adoption of democracy has led them to the collapse they're facing today. Now, not everyone is opposed to democracy. There are some who speak favorably of democracy. You'll find lower on page 7 and on to page 8, Mao Zedong. He is the famous communist dictator of China, talking about democracy in a favorable manner. He says, the democratic revolution is the necessary preparation for the socialist revolution. And the socialist revolution is the inevitable sequel to the democratic revolution. What's he saying? If we have a democratic revolution, it will inevitably lead to a socialist revolution. Therefore, obviously, because he loves to promote socialism, a form of Marxism, he's promoting democracy, because democracy will inevitably lead to socialism. When we see, like we have recently in Europe again, democratic revolutions, that's a red flag to me, because it never leads to a freer people. Eventually, it leads to their collapse. Another that spoke in favor of democracy, we have Woodrow Wilson, an article he wrote called Socialism and Democracy, he's comparing the two and how similar socialism and democracy really are. Prior to being President Wilson, in 1887, he points out, state socialism proposes that all idea of a limitation of public authority by individual rights be put out of view and that state consider itself bound to stop only at what is unwise or futile. What's he saying? Government power shouldn't be limited in order to protect the rights of the people. He's saying the only limit on government power should be what they feel is unwise or futile. Of course, they're the ones that will judge that. That's the vision of state socialism. It's only limited by their own good judgment. That's a little scary. Then next, he demonstrates how democracy and socialism are almost identical. He says, in fundamental theory, socialism and democracy are almost, if not quite, one and the same. They both rest at the bottom upon the absolute right of the community to determine its own destiny and that of its members. Men as communities are supreme over men as individuals. What he's referring to here is the rights of a community trump individual rights. This goes back to the video we watched earlier that majority rule can trample minority rights. What the will of the majority wants can trump your God-given unalienable rights that we talk about in the Declaration of Independence. Later, when he became president, promoting democracy, he says in 1916, he appealed to our nation to enter World War I to make the world safe for democracy. It shouldn't be surprising that it was during the Wilson administration that our nation began to think of itself as a democracy rather than a republic. The word democracy started to have widespread use across our country, convincing us that truly we can do whatever we want as long as the majority goes along with it. So making the world safe for democracy. Next we have in 1940 President Franklin Roosevelt declaring that America must be the great arsenal of democracy. Again, protecting the idea of democracy around the world. And more recently, in 2003, we have President Bush, who portrayed the war in Iraq as the latest front in the global democratic revolution led by the United States. Now, that should be a huge red flag that when we see a democratic revolution, what does a democratic revolution inevitably lead to? Socialist revolution. When we have a global democratic revolution that we're promoting, are we not promoting socialism? In the eyes of Mao Zedong, that's exactly what we were doing. Now, President George Bush also spoke of the war as an effort to spread democracy. Now, with this new understanding of democracy, I began to realize that spreading democracy is not such a good thing after all. It leads people to a socialist state and to collapse like we're seeing in Europe today. So with that, we have a solemn warning that we are not a democracy, we are a republic. And from that foundation, 
we'll begin our study of the U.S. Constitution, the limits of power that the government is supposed to be following. Thank you for joining us for lecture number one.